Hey traders, David Frost, My Strategic Forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Wednesday, January 29, 2020. We are looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. We had a pretty interesting day on our hands today. We had Kabuki Theater this afternoon. We also had a gap in crap. So the market leaves us in a very interesting scenario. The question is, is it a true gap and crap did we miss the gap which we'll get to in a moment and if so what does that mean and what's the next several days look like ahead we're going to discuss these questions we're going to answer them we're going to unpack everything that happened in the market and we're going to take a look at everything i'm seeing you're going to take a journey inside my head what we always like to do is take a look at the first thing that jumps out at the chart when we bring it up on the page here i see a gap and I see that the market looks like it filled the gap. I want to double check. So as far as I'm concerned, the gap is at 328.77. What's the high today? 328.63. So they missed it by basically 14 cents, turned around and went back in the other direction. Do we believe in accidents or coincidences? The answer is no, we don't. They had every opportunity to fill the gap they missed. Here's what it looks like on an intraday 15 minute chart. The top line 328.77 was missed by pennies not once but twice. That's the market's way of telling us something. Why not fill the gap? As far as I'm concerned it's an indicator. And I don't mean the kind of indicators you buy at Joe's indicator shop. I mean an indicator the market is indicating something back to us. That's, to me, what an indicator is. What else we got? We finished near the lows. That's also a negative. You have a gap in crap, a miss of the gap, and you finished near the lows. That's a triple whammy. It's a trifecta. It's a hat trick. Now, what happens tomorrow? Well, let's say tomorrow you find yourself waking up to a gap up. They're rising. It's bullish again. They go and fill the gap. All bets are off. We're right back where we started from. There's nothing wrong with the market. In that case, they're not going to likely stop at the gap. They're likely going to go ahead and hit the big fat round number of ES3300. Just call it 330 in the SPY for argument's sake. There's actually a little disparity. It's short of that. But for argument's sake, that's what would likely happen or even higher. What's another thing that stands out at the chart for me? The volume. Look at the volume today. It was less than the 90-day average. So we had a gap in crap, finish at the lows, and the volume was very, very light, almost like nobody cared. That's a puzzle piece. It's on the table. It's on the other side of the table as the trifecta. You have to play umpire. You have to see both sides of the tape. We're going to throw in a little bit of a short hop for a moment. During Fed Day, I generally turn on the television to get material. There's basically an over-under as to how long it's going to take me to get the material. The over-under is generally about 10 minutes. So within 10 minutes, I start to hear some discussion from pundits on the television. I don't remember who they were. It doesn't make any difference. They're talking about the Fed's target inflation rate, 2%. Great. Here's the topic again. Why does the Fed have a target inflation rate at all? Why does the Fed want inflation? Why do they lead us to believe inflation is good? What they're talking about is everything we buy, the price goes up. So even if you're a business, your cost of materials go up, your cost of goods sold goes up, your prices goes up, the consumer pays more. It's a never-ending cycle. We don't get anywhere by having inflation. There are some entities that benefit from inflation. The market, people that own the market, pension funds rise, mutual funds rise, long the market rises in periods of inflation. That's the whole point of inflation. It's asset inflation and everywhere underneath. Now that's fine for the people that own the stock market that can make money from the stock market. What about all the other people? Do they benefit from inflation? Does the average person benefit from inflation? Does the average person, even if they have some money in the stock market, benefit or actually come out on the short end of the stick of inflation? And I believe, and this is really just an opinion, I believe 
that everybody comes out on the short end of the stick of inflation. That's my two cents. We're off the soapbox, back in our lane. Is there anything else to discuss in the SPY chart? Here's what I would say. If we wake up to follow through to the downside on Thursday, it's an official gap and crap, miss of the gap, and we're likely going to at least retest or come up close to the lows from the other day. Wake up to a gap higher, all bets are off on the downside until further notice. It would be the same old played again, Sam. You never know what you're going to wake up to, just setting the table on both ends. How about Facebook? They reported earnings after the bell, they're getting crushed. So that's certainly not going to help the NASDAQ or the tech space may not hurt all that much in general terms, but it's certainly not going to help. Here's what the daily chart looked like before earnings. Now, could it have easily gone higher? Could it have easily gapped up tomorrow? Sure, we've seen it a hundred times. We've seen it all the time. And guess what? Who knows where it's going to open up Thursday morning. Right now, it's down about eight bucks. Anything can happen going forward. Just thought we would take a look real quick. Let's see where it was trading as it relates to what we'll call the breakout area, the 50 period moving average, a breakup candle low. That looks like a juicy spot. How you doing? Here's a 15 minute chart. You can see what happened. They come into the breakout area, the 50 period moving average, the breakup candle low, and all of a sudden, mysteriously, buyers show up. This is the same thing we do inside the numbers every single day. We'll take a look at the pre-market morning notes. We'll scroll up. We did have the numbers, again, lock, stock, and barrel. Not only the numbers, but we have the direction. We have what the market is doing. The market is singing a tune. It's our job to read the sheet of music. So we'll finish off the pre-market morning notes. You can see what was said. We'll scroll up the other way so you can see what went on as the trading day got underway and we started inside my head right out of the chute. Take a look, pause the video, read the notes, see what happened and go back to the market, pull up a chart and see what happened and look at the time things were said and then see what happened after the fact. If you do that, you'll see what I'm talking about. If you don't care, you won't do that. I get it either way. Nevertheless, let's finish getting through the notes. You can read them again at your leisure. And there it is again inside my head. There was a lot of inside my head today. The market was pretty active and therefore there was a lot to say at times in the morning. And then there was some dead space leading up to the Fed announcement. And then there was plenty to say after the Fed announcement. So the market, all in all, was rather active today, which we like to see. We don't get that every single day. We'll also take a look at the stocks on the move real quick. Even with the gap in crap, we had two opportunities, AMD and Starbucks. We'll take a look at those charts real quick as well. If you're wondering how we do with the important numbers section, this is the important numbers section, as you can see. And with the important numbers, again, Write a few of them down, 3270 in the ES in the left-hand column, 3294. See what the market did in and around these numbers. The 3294 represented the gap, the gap that was missed. Right off, stocks on the move, AMD. Now we're looking at a one minute chart for a reason. The levels or the price, the entry prices, 4755 and 4692, both listed on the page we're close together. When we see target prices like this close together, we take half a position at one, half a position at the second. Here's the reason why. I can see a support zone. I can also see two specific prices that could be support. You can see even in the first minute of the day, they thought about this one for a second, then they went to the second number and rallied right back up. So if you bought half at one, half at the other, your average is in the middle, and within a few minutes into the trading day, it hits a high of 48 bucks. Have a nice day, nice profit, take it and run. Of course, there are days when these things go on a northbound rocket ride, but the market was gap and crapping, so when that happens, we're going to get dragged down. The market magnetically takes some of these stocks down with it. Obviously, they can trade on their own, but under normal garden variety market conditions, you're going to get a lot of the stocks pulled down when you get a gap in crap. So we take the profit, 
It's like a hit and run. We even talked about it in the notes during the trading day. Take some profit, protect the rest. How about Starbucks? Again, here's a one minute chart. So you can see the stock closed yesterday at a price of 88.60. Getting a slight haircut at the open, I saw a spot. 86.59 was put on the board. Look at that rocket ride. A few minutes later, the stock's making a high of $88.44. Again, you have to take money off the table in a situation like that. What's going on over in Camp IWM? Same gap and crap. Remember yesterday, they got the gap by one penny here rather than missing it like in the SPY. Today, they make a slightly higher high than yesterday and then crap out settling on the 50 period moving average. Same rules apply to the SPY. If we wake up to a gap higher in the morning, they'll want to trade into the 20 period moving average. If we wake up to a gap down or a flat market, the same rules apply. Today was a bad finish, a gap in crap, finishing on the lows. In the case of the IWM, we don't have a trifecta, but we have a double header. The volume is still on the other side of the table, less than the 90-day average volume. So therefore, playing the umpire, we have a two-in-one count. Two on the bear side, one on the bull side. I don't know if the one's on a bull side. It's more of a neutral. We can't call it bearish when we don't have the volume to support institutional selling on the gap and crap. Just the way I'm reading it inside my head. Here's an hourly chart. This is going to apply also to the SPY. It applies to anything. I want to just bring your attention to a possible pattern taking place. We talk about these quite often. Haven't talked about them in a while. But it's the good ABC pattern. We have an A leg up, B is a pullback, C would be higher or completion higher than the A leg or the high of the A leg. That's the official completion. If that actually took place and this market traded up into the moving averages, it's not that it's bullish. It's just a pattern that occurs over and over again. And then they could hit the market again if they so choose. So we don't know, it was Fed Day, Kabuki Theater, we may get a Thursday surprise, you just don't know. Again, playing umpire, bringing it to our attention. Why do we do that? Why do we have to look at both sides of the tape? Because if you wake up to a gap up in the morning, you know what's likely happening. You're not surprised. We're pre-planning based on whatever happens when you wake up in the morning. How about the VIX? Do we have the flip side in the VIX? Flip side meaning we missed a gap down below more than we did in the SPY, but we still missed a gap. Is this just a pullback and are we going to make another leg higher? It's the flip side in the SPY. So here's the hourly chart and it's upside down or the mirror image of what we just discussed. So essentially, is this an A, B is the pullback missing a gap and then we head higher into a C leg, completing at minimum of high over the A leg. If we get the gap higher in the stock market tomorrow, you'll get lower prices likely in the VIX. But this is a possibility. It's the flip side of the ABC in the S&P. Not to leave out XYZ. What do we see down at the transportation department? It's interesting. We missed another gap, had a gap in crap. And they finished not on the lows, but low enough. So it was a bad day for the transports as a whole. They went into the 20 period moving average and were essentially rejected. The more you see this, the more you have to say, are we buying the story? They're going to miss these gaps by a smidgen and just trade away, never hitting the gap. It's one of those esoteric puzzle pieces that may not be on the table just yet but they're sliding closer to the puzzle. It's again an awareness thing. We're aware they missed the gap. That's generally a sign of bearish behavior, but there's always an element of skepticism that enters the fold. How about the Qs? They took care of their gap in the Qs, but they didn't necessarily finish on the lows. Above all the moving averages, technically speaking, there's nothing wrong with the Qs. Flat on the day, the other side is, well, it's not the other side, meaning the bearish side, but another thing to consider is it's top heavy. What's it top heavy in? It's top heavy in the names we know. Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, the list goes on. All those stocks 
have been outperforming, or at least most of them. Not the entire tech space is outperforming. So we need to take that into account. How about the XLF? Any information gained in the XLF? Well, we're getting closer to the end of the month. January 31 is the end of the month. We're eyeballing $30.98. We're also interested in $30.25. We spiked higher, filled the gap today for the second time. They filled it yesterday by one penny. They went up higher today. We're rejected. They went into the 50-day moving average. They fell off. But at the end of the day, they were down 10 cents. We can't really gain anything out of that. However, they are in a weak position on the chart. Let's notice where it is on the chart. The financials are below, or at least the XLF, is below the 20 and the 50-day moving average cannot recapture the 50-day moving average. So they are in a weak position on the chart. It's of note. It's on the table. You know what we always say about the financial sector? Without the financial sector rallying, it's unlikely we're going to see a broad-based market rally. And also, if the financials are weak, it's an indication. It's also a leading indicator across the markets. IWM is my favorite leading indicator. Transports is number two. My favorite canary in the coal mine, number one, is the transports. But the financials play a role. The SMH plays a role. And the SMH was down 1% today, leading to the downside. It is a good proxy for the tech space. Not the type of indicator you get from Joe's Indicator Shop, the kind of indicator you get from me. And this one's not a secret. A lot of technical analysts use the SMH as an indicator for the tech space, have for years. Have I told you yet how much I appreciate each and every one of you? You know, without you, these videos are not possible. It's basically everything I wanted to and intended to discuss today, so I will pull the ripcord here. I'm David Frost, my strategic forecast. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.